Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in. It's David Summers and here we go with another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It's the story of wrestling in America as told by the stud whose family started the profession 100 years ago. So now we step back into the ring, back into time. Let's get wall to wall and treetop tall with the Tennessee stud. Ron Fuller, hanging out in the great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. All right, so before we went on, Ron, I was asking, so it gets darker later there than it does here because you're an hour ahead of us, right? Right, right. It's a little odd, man. Hard to figure out the daylight saving time and the, and the <laughs> central time. And the, Wow. It's uh, too bad we can't all be on the same time, man. Did it feel different in St. Pete versus in the Great Smoky Mountains, as, like at sundown? No, I, I think you're probably pretty close, man, and in the in the parallels, I guess, uh, uh, the globe. Uh, so yeah. you know, I think they're pretty, pretty, probably pretty close in the same uh, same range. So it's it's just about the same. Yeah, I think but, uh, I, I would think so. Both of you on Eastern time, and hey, look, congratulations, by the way. Because there's certainly an order for you today, Stud. Last week's Studcast was the biggest first week total of listeners in the history of Studcast. And this is episode number 301. Are you kidding me? So amazing. The further you get into your family and your own history, it seems like the more interest it creates in your listeners. I know that's what it's doing for me. To me, this point we're in right now of 1979, I call it the sweet spot. It's where everything begins happening that really just lasts forever and ever in some some cases. Hey, it certainly seems like it, don't it, man? It does. You know, so... Well, I guess that says a lot, maybe, about my family's past and uh, and about our fans, man, that love this sport so much. You know, I could also, uh, you know, and it could also be that uh, that uh, they're now hearing what was really going on behind the curtain, the Cape Fabe curtain, for the first time ever. Uh, professional wrestling was definitely the most secretive sport in the world from basically the early 1920s when wrestlers started to work matches. Uh, until Vince McMahon Jr. opened the door for good, man, <laughs> after he got in. Yeah, so he just kind of became a vacuum cleaner, I guess you would say. All right, listen, I'm sure just about every fan has their own opinion about that, but you probably wouldn't have been telling us all these fascinating stories if wrestling was still behind those closed doors. And you certainly opened it, I know that. Do you think that fact may have a lot to do with the first growing audience, the g- growing this audience uh, on these stud casts that, that they're experiencing. Well, I don't think, man, there's much doubt about that, Dave. I think, uh, you know, the Knox- Knoxville wrestling war in 1979, it wouldn't have been told in this kind of detail or openness uh, that I'm going to be doing today, man. I'm going to open the door today. And, uh, and if uh, things hadn't uh, changed so dramatically, I wouldn't be at this point. So, uh, what bothers me the most, man, about today's wrestling is the fact that what happens in the ring today, in my opinion, is way too far removed from the kind of matches from the early 19, 20, 1900s, basically, until about the turn of the century in 2000. The sport has changed. What happens in the ring is really changed as much as the kayfabe part of it. Mm. All right. So we've gotten off today on our discussion that could easily 
carry us into two or three stud casts. No doubt about that. I love your title for this one. This stud cast number 301 is called Anxious in Tennessee, Awesome in Gulf Coast. I think most of your fans are so into your 1979 experiences, the war in Knoxville and the introduction of the Hulkster in the Gulf Coast territories. We would probably agree with this title. So where do we, how do you get this thing started? Where do we ride today? Well, we're going to start today, man, in southeastern Knoxville. It's basically in the second week of the war. Uh, anxious was the word to describe it. And uh, so many bad things were happening in that territory, 1979, especially on this stud cast, uh, Coliseum card. It was, it, wow. So this is one of the great examples of, of, of a wrestling war. And it was a card filled with drama, last minute changes, <clears throat> and questions like, who was going to show up and what was going to happen when they did. So the TV show, the results of the card, even the attendance was going to all be questioned for this, for this, uh, the, for this event. And then uh, after getting through that experience, then we're going to thankfully, man, ride south into that awesome southeastern Gulf Coast territory, man, where business and attitudes were great. Uh, we we're going to discuss uh, the big card, Mobile, on Wednesday, June the 6th. 1979. We'll talk about the TV promoted that card, the results of the card and the attendances and all three of the major markets in that territory. And then hopefully, man, if we got enough time, we'll, we'll, we'll pop us another learning tree question. in. <laughs> all right. So listen, it already sounds like a full ride stud. I hope you got your saddlebags packed. All right. So do you want to start with that Knoxville Coliseum card? I think it's Friday, June 8th, 1979. The one you were kind of anxious about, not knowing who would or wouldn't show up to the Coliseum for this from the five wrestlers that were planning to start their own company. Yes, that works, man. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get to that June 8th, 1979 card, let's explain for those that didn't hear maybe the stud cast number 300. And, uh, and at the same time, we'll refresh the memory of those that did get to hear it. And uh, we'll talk about the events that were leading up the prior Friday night, June 1st, to what's going to happen on this June 8th card. So let's go back to Thursday, May 31st, 1979, the day before the June 1st card on the last Friday, preceding us now. And uh, that was the date I fired Bob Roop as a Knoxville booker. That same day, I found out from Dick Slater that Roop and at least four other wrestlers we're planning to attempt to take over my company. Uh, those five wrestlers uh, that I'm uh, I'm going to start to referring to, I, I think I'm going to do this day from here on. Rather than just keep calling them the five wrestlers, I'm going to call them the Knoxville Five from mm -hmm. now on. Yeah. And, uh, those guys were Bob Root, Bob Orton Jr., Ronnie Garvin, the great Malenko, and Ron Wright. And on that same Thursday that we just talked about, I made Dick Slater my new Knoxville booker. Mm -hmm. So – None of the Knoxville five that were involved in the takeover attempt knew Dick Slater had told me anything, and much less everything. So on the night of Friday, June 1st, one week before the card we're going to be discussing on this studcast, I got the entire crew together and told them that Bob Roop was fired as a booker and Dick Slater was going to replace him. And Slater and I had already figured the finishes, and four of the Knoxville five booked on the card, wrestled on the card as scheduled. And uh, Ron Wright wasn't on that card at all, so uh, he wasn't supposed to even be there. So everything went smoothly that night, except the last match. Alexis Smirnoff, the new Southeastern champion, was defending against the former champion, Ronnie Garvin. Uh, Malenko was second in Smirnoff, and Blackwell was second in Garvin, and Smirnoff was supposed to win the match. Uh, on the end of the match, Malenko unexpectedly helped Garvin win the match, and the belt and by holding down Smirnoff's legs, um, Smirnoff was pinned by Garvin in, in the Malenko's corner. He reached in there, put his body on his lower part of his legs, kept uh, Smirnoff from being able to kick out of the pin, and uh, and he got Smirnoff counted out. Ronnie Garvin ended up walking away from the Coliseum with the Southeastern belt. The following day on Saturday, June the 2nd, 1979, on the TV that day, we were, that was going to be promoting the card for Friday, June the 8th, six days later. So uh, 
that's, uh, you know, I think that's pretty good explanation of how that all went. I think it was a real good explanation of what happened so far, Ron. All right, so now we're ready for the Coliseum card, June 8th, 1979. Well, the Friday, June 8th, 79, Knoxville card in the Coliseum was the one I was so anxious about. And and that's why it's kind of in the title of this studcast. I mean, it was a huge question mark the entire night. Dick Slater and I had booked it with all five wrestlers in question on the card, uh, put them on the card. And uh, neither of us had any idea what to expect from them, whether they would show up at all. And, and if they did show up, or, or was somebody going to end up in some shoot matches during the course of the night? So we had several extra wrestlers there and standing by in case some of the five didn't show up. Or if they did and they came with bad intentions, we were planning on taking care of business if it came down to that. So the opening match on this anxious evening was Dr. D, David Schultz, and Eddie Mansfield, who were now calling themselves the Blonde Connection. They were up against Rick McCord and Terry Gibbs. And uh, then there was a very unusual seven-man all-against-all elimination match. The winner of the match was going to get $5,000. Now, So we really took no chances with this, Dave. Uh, So we put four of the five wrestlers and that we didn't trust uh in this on the card they we booked them all in this one match because there were seven contestants in it mm-hmm. uh ronnie garvin bob root the great malenko and ron wright mm-hmm. uh was on the one of the four and then there was eddie mansfield david schultz were going to go wrestle twice and their former gulf coast star eddie sullivan had made his way from pensacola up and it was going to make his first appearance in knoxville uh, in southeastern Knoxville, he had never worked that territory. All right, that's uh, that's brilliant. That's pretty. That's really smart, Stud. If none of the five showed up, it only affected one match on the card. So, I mean, uh, to me, that it's uh, obviously apparent why you did that. And if they did show up, they would have to work it out in the ring by themselves as to who was going to win the match. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's. That's the way Dick and I looked wow. at it. Wow. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, okay. So, so then uh, we, we even backed that up a little bit. We made plans to protect everybody. We backed it up uh, with especially uh, Mansfield Schultz and Eddie Sullivan because they were involved in the ring with four of these guys. And uh, should they, you know, this match uh, turn into some kind of shoot, we had four other guys that uh, were going to be standing in the back by the big black curtain back there taking a look at it. Uh, that was Dick Slater, Crusher Blackwell, the mm. Mongolian stalker. <laughs> the Mongolian stalker was on this card, and me. And we would be watching that match in case there was a problem. Uh, yeah, I kind of like your odds <laughs> in that case. If, uh, obviously, if something had gone wrong. But I think Dick Slater and David Schultz by themselves – would have probably been all that was needed. <laughs> wow. It'd yeah, be true, man. Yeah. Be very close to true. Yeah. You got the stomper there. You got Crusher Blackwell. I mean, so the combined weight is, is just really tilting the scales. Okay. So what was next? Well, the next match was another United States heavyweight, junior heavyweight title match. Uh, it was between Kevin Sullivan and Mike Graham. It was the third of in four weeks, third time in four weeks that these guys had wrestled for this championship between the two. Kevin Sullivan was the champion at this point. Uh, then the rest of the night was all about the quarterfinals of the big Bayliner boat tournament. Uh, we were down to the quarterfinals. Uh, there were eight people left in the tournament, uh, four matches in all. And the first one of those four was going to be me against Bob Orton Jr., who was the fifth guy who wasn't in that elimination match. Uh, the second uh, uh, st- the tournament match was the Mongolian Stomper, who was basically on loan from the Memphis Territory, where he'd been working over there with Rob and that crew that we had sent into Memphis. And he was against Dean Ho. Then Dick Slater was going to be against Black Jack Mulligan from Jim Crockett Seniors, uh, Mid-Atlantic Territory out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Big son of a gun, Blackjack. (laughs) And then the last quarterfinal match of the night was uh, Crusher Blackwell, featured Crusher Blackwell, as a matter of fact, in his main event. 
uh, in the first main event in eight weeks, Dave, since uh, since he was the Canadian Bumblebee. He's finally back in the last match of the night after <laughs> after Bob Roop shoving it up his I'll leave that out. Mm-hmm. You know. But Blackwell, you know, was wrestling against the Russian Alexis Smirnov. All right. So that's that's a really good card. That's a great card. So I don't think calling the night simply the word anxious was enough after hearing all that and, and kind of peeking behind the curtain. So I can't wait to find out what happened. But first Let's see what ha- happened on the TV. You had to use the TV to set it all up. Saturday, June 2nd, 1979. Of course, you could be subtle in some ways, and s- stuff that goes unmentioned is okay. But six days before that Knoxville card, what was the TV like? Well, the entire show was built around the four, qu- you know, the quarterfinal Bayliner Boat Tournament matches. There were four of those. You have four matches on the television show. So we did kind of what we had done on the TV the Saturday before uh, because four of the Knoxville five were in that elimination match and it was the only the second match on the card. Mm -hmm. We didn't put any of those four guys on TV at all, Mm. you know, and uh, only Bob Orton Jr. who was in the boat tournament in a match against me was on the show and he was just in an interview, a one minute interview. So the TV opened with an absolutely beautiful shot of the boat. Wow, that was a beautiful boat, man. Uh, and it was followed by an awesome uh, photo collage of the last eight men in the tournament with a chance to win it. Uh, Dean Ho, facing the Mongolian Stomper, managed by gorgeous George Jr. in the tournament, was in the first TV match on the show. And it was followed by an interview with Dean at the set then a recorded interview from Memphis, Tennessee, with gorgeous George Jr. bragging about his stomper winning the boat. And then he said he was going to have it hauled out of the Knoxville area and put it on a real lake anywhere but Tennessee. He got himself some heat as usual. Then the second match was me getting a win with the fuller leg block. And I was followed I mean, my, by my interview from the set with Les. I went to the set with Les. Bob Orton Jr. did his interview from Studio B. Then the personality profile was done not only about the boat, but on the boat, man. It, it was shot on Norris Lake just wow. outside Knoxville. Wow. It was a beautiful day when they did the, the uh, recording. It was just a fabulous day. And Les interviewed four of us on that boat. Dean O, myself, Dick Slater, and Crusher Blackwell. All of us from a different spot on the boat so that people got to see the boat from inside, outside, front, back. Uh, and then there was a surprise guest in the third match, the third TV match, Black Jack Mulligan, who was 6'8", weighed 320 pounds from Charlotte, North Carolina, mm-hmm. and the Mid-Atlantic uh, NW Territory. He got himself a big win, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dick Slater is going to be wrestling him. He went to the set. He watched the match with Les, and he made comments about how tough an opponent he had ahead of him in the tournament. So Slater stayed at the set with Les, and Mulligan interviewed live out of Studio B right after winning his match. Last TV match was the rapidly rebounding fan favorite Crusher Blackwell. After he had been literally crushed by his booker, Bob Roop, for two months, and he brought the TV studio to their feet, man, when he literally crushed the young wrestler with a splash off the top rope. Wow. It was unbelievable. Then he interviewed with Les from the set, and the very talented Russian man, Alexis Smirnov, did his interview from Studio B. Okay, so th- that really sounds like a great TV. And except for one minute, the one minute interview with Bob Orton thing that kind of it had no exposure at all of the other four wrestlers plotting against you. So I can't go any longer, Ron. This is the reason we've been waiting to find out what happened on Friday night, June 8th, 1979, as you take us to the Knoxville Coliseum. Well, man, I can tell you, Dave, there was a lot of anticipation and anxiety, man, (laughs) between me, Dick Slater, Les Thatcher, Mac McMurray, all the guys that had had a big part in creating that Southeastern company and having built it over the years. Uh, this was a really, really a uh, tough night. Uh, so 10 minutes before bell time, uh, we had our answer about what was going to happen. There were five wrestlers missing from the card, uh, but they weren't missing from the Coliseum. Bob Root, 
Bob Orton Jr., Ronnie Garvin, Malenko, and Ron Wright, they all bought seats, and they were sitting in separate parts of the Coliseum. Basically, they were spreading the word about their new wrestling company that was going to be coming soon. And uh, this was not what I had been hoping for, I can tell you that. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. I was a li- really afraid that it wasn't going to happen, but it seemed like it it was headed in the wrong direction mm-hmm. right off the bat. Uh, okay, so I'm kind of curious, Ryan. Are you saying there was a decent or an honorable way to try to take over or steal a territory? Actually, Dave, there was, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and that precedent had been set seven years earlier in 1972 in the Georgia Territory in what was called the Atlanta War. And it's a fascinating story uh, that actually involves some of my family members. Uh, and maybe when we get to time, I'd love to tell everybody about it and then mm. go further into it, mm. how it was handled. But, uh, but I will make one point about this Atlanta War. The point I was about to make uh, was that the Atlanta Wrestling War of 1972, in that war, neither of the two companies infringed in any way upon the other company. They ran their matches in the same building, one there on a Friday night, the other there on a Saturday night. Wow. They ran on the same TV station. One ran at 6 o'clock, the other ran at 7 (laughs) o'clock the same night. They never once attempted to disrupt nor interfere with anything their competitors was doing. Mm. So that is what I was hoping for in in this upcoming Knoxville war. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the result of the Atlanta war was very different than most wrestling wars before. In prior wrestling wars, most times, both companies ended up bankrupt, and so did the sport in those territories in which the war was had. And professional wrestling died in those wars, for years afterward, I mean, it was it was a horrible thing. It was not a good situation when you had a wrestling war. It usually turned out to be mm-hmm. bad for everybody concerned. In the Atlanta War, however, Jim Barnett, who was the extremely successful Australian wrestling owner, he sold his company in Australia. He came to America. He wanted to come to Atlanta because of WTBS television and Ted Turner. He bought out both of the Georgia companies. And he ended the Atlanta war Hmm. single-handedly. And instead of wrestling being dead when it was over, because these two competing companies simply respected the way they did business against the other competitor, Mm -hmm. wrestling became bigger than ever after the war. That had never happened in a wrestling war prior to Atlanta. Wow. All right. And, And remind me again, this happened in 1972 in Atlanta? Yes, 1972 in the Atlanta Territory. And then eventually came TBS, Ted Turner's station, WTBS as it was known in the beginning. Yeah, the satellite station. Yeah. The and satellite, it, first satellite station in the world. The first one ever. And when it, I, when it came to Dothan, Alabama, we were like, wow, look at this. There's a fourth channel. So, Or there, there was a third channel, whatever it was. And so that's how crazy it was in whatever whatever point i think it was the latter part of 1979 or in the 1970s but anyway that's that's pretty amazing the learning about that war because those of us that didn't have tv out of atlanta until later in the 70s wouldn't know anything about that so the, i mean that's why this this whole war business is pretty interesting when you mentioned that i had heard of that but really no details so i know fans have really never heard this much wrestling history so how do you feel early on in this first night? Well, obviously the Knoxville Five man, uh, had no intention of wrestling on the card or ever being associated with Southeastern wrestling anymore. When they don't, sh- when they show up and they're not going to wrestle and they're going to sit in the crowd, and that being the case, uh, I felt like they shouldn't have been there at all. Uh, that was just a bad, left a bad taste in my mouth right off the bat. And, and they were not going to wrestle. If they weren't going to wrestle, then why were they there? Only to promote their intention, basically, mm-hmm. to create their own wrestling company, mm-hmm. to confuse the customers and the wrestling crowd, and to basically to promote themselves, you know? So the simple fact that they wouldn't even show up at the building, uh, you know, the simple fact that they even came to the building told me that these guys didn't intend to adhere to a normal form of respect or decency, 
especially not the like the ones in uh, 1972 in the Atlanta War uh, had displayed. And uh, mm-hmm. under those circumstances, mm-hmm. uh, I knew this was going to be really a nasty thing. There was even honor in the mafia, some would say. Okay. All right. But so now I see what you're talking about. Bad enough that they were going to attempt to replace your successful company for no apparent reason except greed, but to use your event to push their wrestling company. That's totally inexcusable. I don't I don't see how they thought they were going to get away with that. And that's kind of obvious if you ask me. So what else happened that night? Well, before the match started, I gathered everybody together kind of like I had done the week before. And I had a feeling that most wrestlers in the crew already knew what was going on because this had been going on under, the, you know, under, under wraps for, for six weeks, eight weeks. I don't know how long, but, uh, obviously because they were there that night, all the wrestlers showed up except for those five that meant they'd obviously chosen to stay with me in the national wrestling alliance. So I basically thanked them for it. I told them uh, what little I knew about what was going on. And truthfully, I didn't have any idea what to expect from the five missing wrestlers that night. I told them that uh, they were in the building. I said, these guys are in the building. Mm-hmm. I already know that. Somebody mm-hmm. stood, told me that. And, uh, and I said, I don't want anybody to get hurt. And I don't want anybody to start anything. I don't want any, any, any brawl or nothing to happen that uh that uh, brings any attention to those guys at all right. i told them not to worry about it about them being in the crowd i said go out there man and do what you always do tear the house down yeah then slater and i went back sat down in the dressing room and we began to change the card which we had to do we had a elimination match that was four guys short so the opening match that night was david schultz and eddie sullivan they wrestled against rick mccord and burhead jones and uh that needed no change, changes, and uh, that match was won by David so, by David Schultz. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the seven men all against all elimination match with 5,000 going to the winner uh, was supposed to have four of the Knoxville five in it, Garvin, Root, Malenko, and Ron Wright, mm-hmm. and they were obviously not going to wrestle. So we replaced them with David Schultz, Eddie Mansfield, Mr. Fuji and Tora Tanaka had rode over with the Mongolian Stomper and Gorgeous George Jr. from Memphis. Nice. So, <laughs> so we stuck those big names in yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, you know. So then the, the last three in the elimination match after making those changes was Tommy Rich, George McCreary, and Eddie Sullivan from the Gulf Coast Territory. It was Eddie <laughs> Sullivan, and we put Eddie Sullivan over in that match because we knew he was going to be staying with the company for sure. How close was it for like the Stomper and Gorgeous George for bookings they might have had in Memphis? Did you get close or, or even within a day or so? Well, you know, uh, Friday night was not a good night for that territory, yeah. thankfully. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was our biggest night. So hmm. luckily we were able to get the few guys that we needed in this yeah. case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to make sure we didn't have a problem. So it worked out good for us. So Friday night for you and probably Saturday night over in Memphis. Yeah. They had, yeah. Uh, you know, they ran a smaller town. Their big night was Monday and Tuesday. They were in Memphis Monday, Louisville on Tuesday, oh, gotcha. Evansville, okay. Indiana on Wednesday. Yeah. But uh, they didn't run big towns on Friday. And uh, that was the night I needed, guys. Oh, that's perfect. All right, so that sounds like a better seven wrestlers anyway in that match than it would have been with the other four in it. So did anybody of the Knoxville Five sitting in the building, did they try anything? Did they get noticed? I know they wanted to. Well, those elimination matches, man, they sometimes lasted almost as much as an hour. And Every one of the four wrestlers that were sitting in the crowd they were supposed to be, uh, you know, weren't even supposed to be there and were supposed to be in the ring. At one point or another, they all came down close enough to the ring that they could be seen by the crowd. They didn't make any attempt to actually get into the ring, but they wanted to make sure everybody saw. I'm sure the intention was to create a distraction from the match. And then it had fans asking themselves and the, the other fans around them, what's going on here? Right? Mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. that, who'd ever saw that type of deal? Hey, here's the four guys supposed to be in the ring. Right. And they're standing out in the crowd. What's the deal? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the next match uh, was the United States uh, Junior Heavyweight Championship match, Kevin Sullivan against Mike Graham, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Kevin uh, kept his belt. He won again. Then the first of the four Bayliner boat matches came up. It was me against Bob Warden Jr. So I went to the ring, not knowing what to expect. I was dressed. I was ready for anything. I got into the ring, and I stood there by myself, looking back at the black, big black curtain in the back of the building where the wrestlers normally came from. Mm-hmm. You know, I had no idea where he was in the building. And then so Orton Jr., he finally stood up. He was in the second row of ringside. And he was shouting some stuff at me, but I couldn't hear him. And I motioned for him to come on, get in the ring, you know, time for the match. And uh, he didn't. Huh. So the referee, then, uh, you know, he rang the bell. And he counted to 10. He rang the bell again. And he raised my hand. And I won the match by default. Mm. He wasn't coming mm. in the ring. Uh, it was obvious to everybody. Mm. So, and I'm sure that by that point, fans were really now extremely confused as to what's going on. <laughs> what is this all about? Was he sitting with the other guys? No. He they was, were all uh, sitting in different places in the building. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Nobody was sitting together. They sat all in different areas. Just Okay. So, they spread out. I guess they were trying to spread the message. All right. So, did anything, anything different happen Like in the last three matches? Well, yeah, something very different happened, man, after my win by default. uh, All five of these guys left the building. But instead of leaving, they headed for the parking garages where almost every wrestling fan parked their cars. There wasn't any parking around the Coliseum. They had these huge parking garages, and they held all the cars that – you could fill up the building with, uh, and, and people had plenty of place to park in the garages. Mm. So, uh, they went into these parking garages and they left these eight by 10 flyers on every car's windshield telling fans that they would be wrestling for another company called all star wrestling the next Saturday night, mm. June the 16th, 1979 in Chihuahua park one night after we were wrestling in the same venue. <laughs> All right, so that was, I mean, to me, that's cheesy. That's, uh, I don't know, That's that was guerrilla marketing before its time, but that's pretty cheesy right there, Stud. Any example of what you said earlier about the importance of not meddling with the other competing wrestling company and assuring the continuation of the sport after the war? So, I mean, that's just silly. All right, so who won the last three boat matches? Well, the Mongolian Stomper, managed by Gorgeous George Jr., won his match with Dean Ho. Mm. Dick Slater won over Black Jack Mulligan. And Crusher Blackwell beat Alexis Smirnoff. So the following week, we're going to come back. In the semifinals of the tournament, it's going to be me uh, against uh, Mongolian Stomper, uh, Dick Slater mm. against Crusher Blackwell. And uh, then the week after that, we're going to find out who wins that beautiful boat. Uh, I, I tell you this this whole story of this particular night in Knoxville is uh, is history just right there on this one night. So we've gotten into the first part of this stud cast. How about attendance for this evening stud that that night? Well, it was forty three hundred a week before, and uh, and I stayed uh, and it stayed almost the same this week. At a, it was about forty one hundred. It was a little less than the week before, and uh, and it was because of. You know, the reason that it, don't, it didn't drop more is because all of the car, stars were on the card. Mm-hmm. People didn't know that Garvin and these guys aren't going to wrestle. Right. You know, so uh, so the attendance figures were, uh, were in the future, man, headed for a big dive. I can say that. Yeah, I was kind of afraid of that. And I bet you were obviously thinking about that, too. So, hey, this is a good point for a break. So when we get back, we're going to ride south into the awesome part of the title of this stud cast. The title is Anxious in Tennessee, Awesome in Gulf Coast. It's going to get better as we head south. We'll do that after the break when we come back in Gulf Coast. That's on the way. Hey, Studcast fans, have you been on Ron's YouTube channel, Southeastern Rewind, lately? Have you seen the short rides with the stud? There are now 40 of them. And each one has a totally different subject, lasts only 6 to 12 minutes, and gives you a tremendous inside look at so many different aspects of the wrestling business. 
a new one goes up every other day. Every short ride comes from a total show of some kind on his streaming channel, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Subscribe now to Southeastern Rewind on the YouTube channel and get the short ride. Then graduate to the ClassicContinentalWrestling.com streaming channel for the long ride. Today, it's only $4.99 per month or $39.99 per year. All right, Studcast fans, welcome back in. David Summers with the Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller, episode number 301 as we jump into the second segment of this two-part show. So we finished the anxious night in the Tennessee Territory. Now it's time for the awesome part of this Studcast when we go to Southeast Gulf Coast Territory. We're going to be going back to Mobile, Alabama, Wednesday night, June 6, 1979, so set us up on this mobile card. Who was on it? Well, it had seven matches on this one, which was one more than the one in Knoxville had. The opener was Herb Calvert against Armand Hussein. Uh, Bob Griffin, the new guy, met Eddie Sullivan, managed by Billy Spears. Austin Idol took on Roy Lee Welch. The Dargon Twins. Uh, this is a couple of guys that Louie had found somewhere, man. I don't know how he tracked these guys down, <laughs> but they were making their first appearance, and uh, they were going to be uh, facing, wow, one of the greatest uh, tag teams of all time, man, the Infernos, the two Infernos, uh, who were making their Southeastern debut as well as these Dargon twins. <laughs> so then for the Southeastern belt, new champion Gladiators, managed by Billy Spears, was going to be defending against the former champion, Ron Slinker, in a best two out of three falls match. Then there was the Southeastern Tag Belts on the line again. The champions of Samoans managed by Spears against Ricky Fields and Terry Latham. And the main event was a return match between Terry the Hulk Boulder and Ox Baker managed by Billy Spears. Mm -hmm. This time it was in a lumberjack match with wrestlers around the ring we were going to throw the contestants back in when they left the ring. <laughs> that's some big old boys to be throwing back in, but all right, that's a loaded card. It's a great card. Two title matches, two tag matches, and a lumberjack match. All right, so what about the TV show five days earlier to set up this card? Well, it was loaded as well, man. I mean, uh, Louis Tillet uh, told me, uh, you know, um, me and Louis talked about uh, all the time. We talked every day about what was going on down there. He was doing such a good job. And he told me Billy Spears uh, with Ox Baker opened up the show. They were sitting at the set with Charlie Platt. And that the TV show actually opened up, rather than coming to the set and then going to the video, it actually opened it up, opened up with the video from Mobile three nights earlier. And it showed Hulk and uh, Ox Baker fighting on the floor of the Expo Hall, uh, and uh, the wrestlers had come out of the dressing room and had surrounded them. We're trying to get them to stop, trying to get them separated. So uh, as soon as the cameras came back uh, to the set, Billy Spears, as usual, jumped right in as soon as the cameras came back on to him. And he started accusing the Hulk of knocking out the referee, uh, fighting uh, with Ox out in the crowd, and then causing everyone from both dressing rooms to have to come to the ring to try and stop him before he injured some fans, and that Hulk was a maniac. <laughs> he should be barred from the ring all over the country. <laughs> this guy that he loved so much, it just turned totally rotten. And so, of course, yeah. You know, so Charlie, man, he hit him right back. He said, well, you, you know, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Billy, he goes, Ox Baker has a much more dangerous reputation than the Hulk would ever have. Yeah. He said, at least the Hulk has never been called a, a possible killer. <laughs> <laughs> so Billy, <laughs> Louis said, Billy got so upset. He just grabbed Ox and he said, let's get to the ring. They went straight to the ring. They were going to be in the first match anyway. So he didn't have a comment. He just left the set. You know, and they took Ox and put him in the ring, and then he forced him to annihilate. Uh, Charlie told me, he said, it was horrible, Ron. He just made Ox Baker just try to kill this poor guy that was in the ring, you know. <laughs> and he said, uh, and he said, Billy was out of control. You know, he got a little upset at what I said, you know, but he was jumping up and down in the ring and screaming at me from the ring. 
you know. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, uh, so then it wasn't over with, you know. He said, uh, he said uh, then he told Ox Baker, he says, uh, get him up, hit him with a hard punch. Hit him a hard punch. <laughs> yeah, and he said the referee had to pull the kid out of the ring to keep it from happening. Wow. So the Ox was going to go do it. He was going to hit him. So, uh, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Classic Charlie Platt on that one. All right, what a way to open a TV show. That's how you do it right there. One of the most fearsome-looking men on earth being directed by one of the most despised managers of all time. So how do you how do you follow something like that? Jeez, man, well, how else, man, with another heel, man? One is just <laughs> as determined as Ox Baker was to get over, man. And that was Austin Idol, man. And uh, in that match, uh, he applied his figure four and the referee had to pull him off. He wouldn't let the figure four go. Uh, kid uh, had given up, and the ref had to had untangle their legs. So, uh, wow. Well, it didn't stop with just Ox. It went right straight into Austin Idol. Wow. All right. So, I think the personality profile was coming up. Who'd you have on that? Well, the hope was on this one. And uh, he and Charlie watched the entire video that that TV show had opened up with. Uh, they just showed a piece of it before coming to the set. And it showed exactly how the referee had been eliminated, not by the Hulk, like Billy had said, but by Billy Spears. Billy Spears had knocked the referee down and knocked him out. And uh, then there was a wild fight off the end of the match, and both dressing rooms got involved. And uh, so uh, Charlie and uh, the Hulk uh, discussed the upcoming Lumberjack match. That was going to be seen in all the three major markets. Obviously, they didn't say that, but uh, they're plugging that match because it's going to be in all the cities and in the coming week. Uh, and it was a special lumberjack match, too, because the for the first time in southeastern history, this thing was going to have 16 wrestlers surrounding the ring. It was a huge card. It was 18, 19 men on that card. So uh, there were going to be a lot of guys around the ring. So Charlie got the opportunity toward the end of the profile to hit that little thing that he liked to do uh, after Hulk had beaten the Harley race. <laughs> and, you know, he got a chance to call him the uncrowned NWA world champion. And uh, <laughs> and uh, at this point, I had already contacted Sam Mutchik, and uh, I had managed to get Harley race, a date for Harley race, to come back to Dothan, Alabama in July to defend this time the belt against the Hulk. Wow. Yeah. And uh, obviously it didn't mention that match was taking place on this profile or, or anything about the match because it was just too far in the future at that point. Yeah. And I didn't want to take the emphasis off of the Hulk and Ox Baker's match and uh, because they were drawing big crowds. Uh, they were they were making money in the territory. Mm -hmm. The third match on this TV show was the new Southeastern champion, having won the belt the night before, the Gladiator, managed by Billy Spears was defending his new belt on TV versus the very popular Herb Calvert. Calvert was very well liked at this point. He'd had so many matches with people out of the crowd, and he was a gentleman in all those matches. The Gladiator won. Obviously, he beat Herb with his sleeper hope. And then the last match was Terry the Hulk Boulder uh, versus Eddie Sullivan, managed by Billy Spears. And this one got totally out of control, man. Uh, Hulk ended up putting his bear hug on Sullivan. Mm. And when he did, Spears came into the ring, and uh, he nailed Hulk from behind. Uh, the referee started ringing the bell to disqualify Spears and Sullivan, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hulk, at that point, you know, Spears had hit him from behind. Hulk was more than happy to let Sullivan go. He just turned around and put Spears in the bear hug. <laughs> that was well, the studio that. crowd, man, they were happier <laughs> about it than the Hulk was, man. So. And then uh, here came Ox Baker, man. Uh, he knocked the referee down, threw him out of the ring, and then he kicked Hulk in the back. Hulk never saw him coming. And then the Hulk went down, but he was still holding the bear hook on Spears. He landed on top of Spears. He had Spears underneath him. Uh, then came the preview of the Lumberjack match for the following week. Uh, Louis said Ricky Fields came, Terry Latham came. They were the first two to get to the ring. Then the two Samoans came, Ron Slinker came, Herb Calvert came, Austin Idol came, Bob Gr He said, wow, the ring just was full of guys. It was total pandemonium in the studio. Bell was just continuously ringing. 
uh, two referees by that point were out there. They trying to get it stopped. And, uh, and it was all just a taste of what was going to happen when you had 16 of these guys standing around the outside of the ring the next week. All right, Stud, since you brought it up, what did happen the next week on that card in all three major markets in southeastern Gulf Coast? Well, Herb Calvert, he beat Armand Hussein. Uh, Eddie Sullivan, managed by Billy Spears, won over Bob Griffin. Austin Idol, who was still undefeated since he had arrived in southeastern wrestling, he got a win over Roy Lee Welch. Uh, the new tag champions, uh, tag teams, uh, they were facing each other for the first time. Both of them knew. Was the world-famous Infernos. They got a win over this team, Louie, that wanted to have a look at. Leroy and Luther, the Dargon twins. Uh, the Gladiator had to defend his new Southeastern belt on TV the mm -hmm. day after he won it. He had done that that day. He successfully defended it again against Ron Slinker in the best two out of three fall match that they were having for that championship. And then the seemingly unbeatable Samoans lost their Southeastern tag title match to Fields and Latham by disqualification when Billy Spears got involved in the match. But they did, however, keep, kept their belts because they had lost by DQ. But uh, it was one of the first times that Spears and Latham got their hands raised. So then Louis said the Hulk versus Ox Baker lumberjack match was wild in all the towns. He said every one of those lumberjacks forgot their jobs was to throw Hulk and the Ox back in the ring when they got outside. Mm -hmm. And he said about the first time the Hulk and the Ox got outside the ring, <laughs> Instead of, instead of these guys throwing the two that they were supposed to back in the ring, they started touring to the wrestlers that they had just wrestled earlier in the night. <laughs> and the match was declared a no contest. Everybody was fighting everybody. <laughs> Louis said it was like one of those old Western and old barroom brawl, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was happening all over the building. Oh, it was cool when that was happening because there was something to see over to the left, over to the right, right in the middle. All right, so it sounds like a great night for the fans. So how about the attendance in all three of the major markets? Well, one of the three markets had a jump in attendance, Montgomery, since it had yet to fill its downtown Civic Center. Uh, the Farm Center had been selling out. The Mobile uh, Expo Hall had been selling out. The downtown Civic Center uh, had that... The week before, 4,300, it went up to 4,500. Still wasn't totally full, but wow, it was a great crowd in, Mon in Montgomery as well. Mobile's Expo Ho Hall had its second straight sellout, 5,600 people. Dothan was right up there close to Mobile with just under 5,000, about 4,950. Mm -hmm. And then the southeastern Gulf Coast uh, it drew more than 15,000 fans in just three nights. Wow. I have to say the word that I used in the title, it was awesome. There you go. It's got to be feeling a lot better when you head south. All right, especially in this case, uh, occasion. All right, that'd be a great way to end this one, Stud, right there. But we're we're not done yet. I can't believe it. We are going to have enough time left to answer a learning tree question. We went a few weeks without. We brought it back last week. Let's do it again this week. So this one comes from Calvin Bloomfield, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He asked, I have heard you come from the oldest and largest professional wrestling family in the world. Are you aware of the Hart family in Canada? If so, what are the things in common, if any, to your Welch family? <laughs> oh, well, that's, a, that's a darn good question, man. Uh, you know, I love this one, Dave. I love this question because, uh, wow. Well, Mr. Bloomfield, you know, I think it was. I, I got a, I'm very familiar with the Hart family, uh, extremely familiar with the Hart family, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, and I know they're from Calgary, Canada. And I have many thoughts that come to my mind here about a way to answer your question here uh, and about that fantastic family. And they really were and they really are to this very day, you know. But the thing, we, you know, we probably most have in common because you asked about things I had the Welches had in common with the hearts uh, was the love of one wrestler. Crazy thing, but I, mm. I got to, this is mm. the only, this is what really comes to mind when I, when I think about that question. Mm. 
and uh, and and uh, they take it back to uh, as a member of the National Wrestling Alliance with my southeastern companies. I got to know Stu Hart who was the patriarch of that family. He was the guy who was the man. He was where it all started, Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and, and I got to be real close friends with, uh, with Stu Hart. And he was also a member of the NWA. And, uh, we had someone, uh, but in common, uh, me and Stu Hart that, uh, that, was and made all the difference in the world, and and this is and, and this guy was Archie Goldie, the Mongolian Stomper. Wow! Uh, Stu had trained Archie Goldie, ah. uh, and then many years later, I was blessed to find Archie Man, and I brought him into my company, uh, Southeastern in Knoxville, uh, early in '75. Uh, uh, I brought him into my business. I respected him. I admired him. I loved Archie Goldie, just like he was my father. Yeah, and Archie was probably 15, 20 years older than I was. He was, he looked, he was 65 or 70 years old, and he mm-hmm. looked like he was 40. You know, he had this great body. He just, he never got old. Wow. And uh, and once he started wrestling for me, he never wrestled for anybody else after that. He never went to another territory. So, you know, Archie felt the same way about Stu Hart as Stu felt about Archie. Stu loved him, too. And the love that Stomper had for Stu was obvious. Every time he told me a story about him, I could see it in his face, man, uh, sometimes in his eyes. Uh, and, And he told me a story about Stu's dungeon in the basement of his house. He lived in a house big old house on the hill in Calgary, big tall hill. And uh, Stu's downstairs, Stu had a wrestling ring in, in his, what he called his dungeon, which tells you a lot about what went on down there, right? Yeah. And, uh, and he had nailed these little nails in the walls around the ring, that, and only Stu knew where the nails were. And, and about, and you know, then Archie told me about the rare times. He said, on a couple of occasions, Ron, he said, I really felt like I was going to beat him. That, I, that you know, I could, I could actually maybe beat him. And he said, when I got really close to it, he said, he would pick me up and he would drive me into the walls. He said, he knew where the nails were. <laughs> and he said, the little tiny nails would stick into my back. He said, obviously, I could never beat him because he always had the upper hand. He would always do that to me. So, you know, and Archie and I had some laughs about the story, but gosh, that says a multiple about. So, and when Archie told me that, there wasn't an ounce of animosity in, in what he was saying, you know, uh, as, as you would expect, you know, mm-hmm. because he only had love for, for Stu Hart, man. Wow. Because Stu was the guy that took the time and the effort to give Archie his chance to live the life he always dreamed of. That's mm-hmm. why Archie told me. I remember he'd have tears in his eyes, man. You know, he said, I always wanted to be a professional wrestler. And he gave it to me, Ron. He, he did it for me, right? Wow. So every August, when I used to go to the NWA meetings in Las Vegas, Nevada, Stu and I would take the time to go to somewhere and sit down together. And we discuss always the same subject. One of the greatest wrestlers of all time, the, the Mongolian Stomper. Wow. And, and Stu, uh, Stu talked often to Archie and he knew Archie and I, how we felt about each other. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so at the end of this, I'm going to do something, uh, you know, and, and, and I hope this isn't going to upset anybody. You know, Stu Hart was, a uh, Stu was one of the true great characters of the business in the sport. I mean, everybody loved him, but he was, there was nobody. He he was his own person and, uh, and he had a way of talking and, and I just want to, uh, you know, we would go and meet and, uh, you know, we would, uh, we would talk about, uh, Archie. Most of the conversation was always about Archie. And, uh, what I want to do here, Dave is, I want to impersonate. I'm going to become Stu Hart, and I want to uh-huh. kind of say how this story used to go. <laughs> Let's hear it. Yes. Okay. 
you know, and then we'd be sitting somewhere and he'd say, he'd say, uh, get the, uh, run, uh, 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 the, get the, uh, the guy, uh, I urge, I urge, I urge. And, and I would have to answer it. Yeah, Archie, Archie. Yeah, yeah, Archie. Got the run. Uh, Archie, did he, uh, has he, uh, will he, uh, uh, <laughs> you mean, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? <laughs> well, I got the, you, you know, Ron, uh, Arch, he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. I say, you know, so that was kind of the conversations we had, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, wow. I got to be so close to Stu Hart. Uh, and the bad thing about it for me is I never got to actually meet any of his sons. Didn't meet oh, wow. Brett, didn't meet Owen. Wow. Uh, didn't have the opportunity to meet those guys. Oh, uh, but you met the uh, leader of the clan. Wow. wow. Yeah, but but my brother did. And Jimmy oh. did. You know, they they spent time with Owen and they spent time with with Brett. And uh, you know, I I, I missed all that. But I got to meet the big man, the, the guy that was really responsible for all of it. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to have tell some more stories. Some of the best stories that I have are about Stu Hart. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think we probably don't have any more time today. <laughs> but uh, wow, I loved Stu Hart. And I really loved the Mongolian Stomper. Okay, I got to ask you because obviously you developed a relationship with Stu Hart. So did did your brother, uh, did your brother Robert, or did Jimmy? D had they ever met Stu Hart like you had? No, no. Okay, so they, they never... met the sons, and you met the father. Yes, crazy. Wow. That's that's awesome. All right. And I got one question about Archie, uh, the man known as the Mongolian Stomper. What was he like in person in the locker room? Was he a quiet, kept to himself guy? Or was he just one of the guys? He, he was just one of the guys, but he had a tremendous personality. Uh, he was one of the most liked wrestlers I ever met. He uh, he everybody loved him. Uh, what a great person he was. Uh, just the opposite of what his character was. I mm. mean, he, he was wow. just amazing. He would turn into the stomper just when he needed to. <laughs> but, uh, wow, other than that, he went on. He lived in Knoxville. He, he he actually died in Knoxville just a few years back. Wow, yeah. And uh, and he became a policeman oh, in no the kidding. latter years in yeah. Knoxville. Wow. All right, listen. That that answer was uh, was absolutely something. Stud the whole thing, the whole setup. Hearing you talk about Stu Hart, and uh, I, I can't imagine how many people know that, or how many times you've told that story before. Of course, we knew the relationship with you and Archie, and I think that's absolutely amazing. So, listen, you've really opened the curtain in this stud cast, and it finishes with how close some of you wrestlers really were to each other. We begin with the title Anxious to Awesome, and I think we finished that way. Absolutely awesome. So this has been another great stud cast. So how do you top this, and where do we ride next week? Let's try. Well, the Knoxville War is still going to be the focus, man, and, and why not? I mean, since wrestling wars were so rare, uh, and, and I'm going to tell all of it. I'm, you know, we're going to fans are going to learn stuff that they never dreamed they would learn. And uh, and this was an extremely difficult time for me, man. Uh, I, I was losing five top guys all at once. And the next time fans were going to see those guys wrestle, it was going to be the very next week. And it wasn't going to be for Southeastern. I mean, Gosh, it, to me, that was just is almost unbearable. Uh, so we'll talk about, the, you know, their card. We'll talk about what who was on their card, as well as Southeastern. We're going to do that in these upcoming studcasts. We're not just going to talk about what we were doing. We're going to talk about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about our TV and the match results, uh, our matches and the attendance. And uh, then uh, we'll head down to the Gulf Coast, down to the Gulf Coast, and uh, – and we're going to have uh, one more Ox Baker and Hulk match. And then Ox is going to be headed to Japan for five weeks. Mm. So next week down there, one of the greatest wrestlers in the world, one of the most recognizable wrestlers in the world is going to make his Southeastern debut, got down in the Gulf Coast, Bobo Brazil is wow. going to work wow. in that territory. 
And Austin Idol, who is beginning on his march upward, man, is about to take a big step up in the territory as well. Wow. Okay, folks, on Facebook, go to Ron Fuller Welch, the Tennessee stud, on Facebook. Like and follow to become friends with a living legend. Same thing on Twitter. Find him on Twitter, Ron Fuller Welch, and follow him there. Check out his website, tnstud.com, for every stud cast ever done. 43 Super Studcast and his stud store for all kinds of souvenirs. Get your personally autographed copy of his novel, Brutus. It is there. His YouTube channel, Southeastern Rewind, is red hot, closing in on 300 hours of video. The last 81 stud cast are there. 52 stud stories, 40 short rides with the stud, and five Ask the Stud question and answer shows. Subscribe now. YouTube Southeastern Rewind. When it comes up, put in Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. YouTube Southeastern Rewind is the gateway to ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. ClassicContinentalWrestling.com, the Studs' tremendous streaming channel. Check it out now. There are now more than 250 hours of classic wrestling entertainment and it's all there. Gulf Coast, Southeastern, Continental, and USA TV shows. All in the order which they were recorded. That's how it's meant to be. ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. You can follow the story as you watch the episodes. Plus 19 chapters of Ron's audio version of his best-selling lion novel, Brutus. Six stars of the sport. Four superstars of the past and documentaries with something new every day. All of this $4.99 per month or $39.99 per year, plus the free one-week trial is still available. Classic Continental Wrestling.com. It is the best deal in wrestling. Any final words, Stud? Yeah, man. I'd like to thank everybody for their support and uh and and you know for for helping break the, another stud cast record. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I can't believe that, that we still are growing and the audience is just getting bigger and bigger. And uh, and you, if you enjoy this this one, uh, for fans out there, if you did enjoy them, uh, please tell somebody about us and what we do here. And take care of yourselves and others. And may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller of the Great Smoky Mountains, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud, LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.